Working Cows Podcast, Episode 34. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. This episode has been brought to you by chriswilliamsaudio.com. Head on over to chriswilliamsaudio.com for all your audio production needs. Hey everybody, it's Clay Connery from the Working Cows Podcast. Just uh, sitting down here, ready for another great episode. We got Kathy Voth on today. We're talking about turning your cows into weed eaters. So I hope you really enjoy this uh, challenging episode. I think this is going to be one of those where you go back and listen a couple of times and just have your paradigm challenged a little bit and maybe try to be open to an entirely new way of thinking about things. So check out this episode with Kathy Voth. Kathy is the editor and a contributor to OnPasture.com, and she'll get into a little bit more of her history in the intro, so I'll leave you to the episode with Kathy Voth of OnPasture.com. Kathy, thank you for agreeing to sit down with me again. Um, I'm a new podcaster still, I guess. I'm over six months in, but still having some challenges here and there, so I appreciate you being gracious enough to sit down with me again. Oh, it's it's my pleasure. It was fun last time, and we'll have fun again. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, last time it was it was very good and um, very mind expanding. But I'd like to give you an opportunity to um, share a little bit about your past, your history, what you what kind of brought you to be doing what you're doing now. Well, I, I have kind of an odd history, I guess. Um, how I got to it. Let, let's just start with how I got to the cows eating weeds part. I was working for the Bureau of Land Management, um, and I was a public information officer on a fire where 14 firefighters died. And then I spent the whole next year working with the community and their families to put together a memorial trail and a memorial monument in the park in the town, and it, it really changed my life. Um, and one of the things that I really thought about going forward was how do we protect firefighters who are trying to protect homes in wildland urban interface areas? You know, where, when we build our homes right up next to the forest or in areas that are really prone to burning because they're wild. And about that same time, I was transferred by the Bureau of Land Management to Utah State University, and my job was to be a science liaison between the university and the BLM and other organizations, and also to run projects. So I had a pet goat, and there was a guy that worked just down the hall from me, and uh, we were talking about my pet goat, and he actually worked at Camp Williams National Guard Training Facility as the fire management person. They had a lot of concerns about, um, you know, firefighting exercises and or you know, live live ammunition sparking fires and things like that on the base. And so his job was to figure out how to prevent those kinds of things from happening. And we got to talking about goats and all the things they could eat and how some people had begun to use them as fire breaks. So we decided, hey, we'll do this little project with goats. That little project turned into like seven years of work. And we actually, uh, we got a large grant. And I, in the end, put together a CD handbook on all the logistics surrounding how best to manage goats for creating fire breaks. The idea being that if fire, if the fire slows and stops in certain areas, then firefighters have a safe place to, to fight their fires from. So here I have this 130 goat herd <laughs> that's expanding every year as goat herds do. <laughs> and I was, I started looking at all the other things that goats could do. And one of them was, of course, they eat weeds. 
And so I started approaching ranchers in the West, you know, the, the kind of people that run cattle on, I don't know, a thousand acres minimum. And I said, you know, if you had goats, then you could uh, have them eat the weeds. And all this research shows that if you have five goats every cow, you could, like, um, really have lots of good forage and blah, 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 blah. And they looked at me <laughs> like I was crazy. And they were right. Because, you know... Um, Goats take a whole different kind of fencing, and goats take a whole different kind of marketing if you're going to sell them for meat animals and things like that. So it's a really hard thing for a, a Western rancher to decide, yeah, I'm going to include goats in my operation. But <laughs> I am not the kind of person that you can say no to. Um, I, in general, I try and find a different way. And so my basic idea was that, you know, ranchers have these wide open spaces. They have lots of weeds. And they need, you know, the, the typical way of spraying them and fighting them that way doesn't appear to be working very well. And it costs a lot of money, so animals who graze them could be a useful tool. And I was also working at the time at Utah State University with Fred Provenza and all of his colleagues, and they were looking at how animals learned to what to eat. And so I decided that if all of the things that he had learned were actually true, then I should be able to teach a cow to eat a weed, and that would be much easier than teaching ranchers to have goats. <laughs> so what I did was um, I had a friend working at the uh, Grant Coors Ranch National Historic Site, and he um, this is a functioning ranch that's part of the National Park Service, and they keep cattle and, and run them on this really beautiful range because they're part of a, you know, letting people know what our historic past was like in Montana and places like that. And they had a weed problem. So we put together a little bit of funding to run a pilot project to see if I could actually teach cows to eat weed. So that was back in 2004. And sure enough, it worked. And it wasn't that hard. It was actually very easy. And so... Since then, I've been going around telling people how they can teach their cows to eat weeds. I've actually um, managed to reduce the time that it takes to train an animal down to, oh, about eight hours spread over seven days. And what happens then is that after cows learn to eat one eat weed, they start to eat all kinds of weeds. And they do this all on their own, and they teach their offspring, and they teach their herd mates. And in no time at all, you have a weed-eating herd and 43% more forage. <laughs> nice. That's a big difference. 43% uh, more forage is almost like half another ranch, right? Exactly. <clears throat> and so my thought was that, you know, once I told people, I, I basically, I wrote one article in Beef Magazine, and I wrote several artic articles in Stock and Graph Farmer, and I told people exactly how to do this. And I thought, there, my work is done, because everybody's <laughs> going to look at this and think, oh, holy cow, I could have a lot more forage, I could run more cows, I could make more money, I don't have to spray. Hallelujah. But that's not what happened. <laughs> 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 so, anyway. So what did happen? Here I am. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> what did happen is, uh, well, nothing pretty much. <laughs> oh, okay. There, was there any negative um, there, feedback? Well, yeah. Over the years, there's been lots of negative feedback. People, <laughs> I've had people call me up and actually say, are you a kook? And I'm like, <laughs> no, why do you think I'm a kook? And I, you know, one time I went to a, a grazing conference. I was invited to speak at a grazing conference in Missouri. And uh, I came to talk about goats and teaching cows to eat weeds. And what these people, I mean, they I had they set me up at a little table at, between presentations. And I had my little DVDs there that people could, could buy um, if they wanted to learn how to do this on their own. And uh, people just came by and poked fun at me and laughed at me. And I was really upset by the time I got home. Mm. And then a number of years later... They uh, invited me back, and they thought I was the best thing since sliced bread. Mm -hmm. And here's the difference. What I learned along the way is that 
people need about 10 years worth of data to, in order to really start to consider a change. Mm -hmm. And so in, in 10 years, what I did was I went around to a lot of different ranches and I taught a lot of different kinds of animals from bison to cows, sheep to goats. I taught, <laughs> I, I've taught my cat to eat things. So basically, I have I had all of this information about how it works and and how easy it is, and people started paying attention. So now it's becoming a little more common. So sure, that's a good sure. thing. Yeah, very good. So let's spend some time talking about the process. Okay. What does this process look like? How does how does it work from start to finish? You come in with cows that are on grass and not selecting for weeds, and then you leave seven days later after about eight hours of work, and they are they have learned to select for weeds, or at least they're they're open to the idea of eating them. Right. Okay. So here's how it goes. The first thing that I do is um, I look at the plant that I want to teach the animals to eat. And what most people are worried about is toxins in plants. And what I have found over the last, I don't know, I guess we're at 14 years now, um, what I've learned is that while all plants contain some kind of toxin in them, it's the dose that causes the problem. And there are very, very few plants that have such a high dose of a toxin that it will kill your animal outright. There are plants that can cause cumulative damage, and so I have lists of those as well. But basically, I have a list now of all kinds of plants that animals can eat, and they include pretty much all of the weeds that people are most concerned about in their pastures. Um, the other thing that, that I look for um, is how nutritious is this weed? Mm -hmm. And pretty much how I look at nutrition is how what's the level of protein in the plant? Because for most range animals, protein helps them gain weight at a quicker rate. So, for example, anything that's got about 16% protein in it, which I learned this from a fellow trying to sell his supplement at a conference I was going to, if it's got about 16% protein in it, uh, it can help your animals gain about 2.2 pounds per day. That's really nice. <laughs> um, you could buy his supplement, or you could teach them to eat Canada thistle, <laughs> which is between 16 and 21, depending on what time of year you're grazing it. And, in fact, most weeds are between 16 and 21. Um, leafy spurge can go up beyond that. <laughs> um, but typically... They're the equivalent of alfalfa in nutritional value. Mm. So this should also be pretty exciting to farmers and ranchers to know that all this time, the thing they were fighting is actually oftentimes more nutritious than the grass they keep wanting the cows to eat. Mm. So what, what I do next, okay, now I know my plant is nutritious and we're going to feed them. Oh, uh, let's, let's, the first, the first plants I ever taught a cow to eat was Canada thistle, leafy spurge, and spotted napweed. Those are the first three. So we can kind of talk about those. Um, what, <laughs> what I do now is I choose which animals I want to train. And pretty much what I choose now are just whatever animal is going to stay on your place for a while. So, you know, you may be working with stalkers, and you can train stalkers, and, you know, it doesn't take very much time to, to train them. But if, if you've got like a cow or a cow-calf pair or something with them, that would be nice because then you can have that cow train the new stalkers that show up the next year. Hmm. So I just mostly think I started out teaching heifers, but what I found pretty quickly was any, any animal can learn. They learn really quickly about because it involves food. And so just use what's most convenient for you, which animals are Stay on the place. Don't give a college education to somebody who's just going to eat at the end of the season. Okay? <laughs> but, you know, you can, but keep somebody around who knows this because they can spread them out. Hmm. So, 
Now I have my animals. How many should I train? Um, it depends on the size of your herd, but I tend, especially in the West where herds are larger, I tend to teach about 50 at a time. And it, it really, again, just depends on what your operation is like. You can pull, just use animals that it's easy for you to get to, easy for you to maybe separate out from the rest of the herd or whatever. If you know, one time I trained a hundred cow calf pairs at a time, and it wasn't that hard. I just had to alter how I how I trained them a little bit. And if somebody has that big a herd, they are welcome to send me an email, and I'll tell them how it works. <laughs> and it's not that hard. Okay, so now I have my herd. Should I put them in a corral? Well, only if I want to spend the time to feed them and water them myself. What I really prefer to do is just leave them in pasture. And it should be a pasture where the weed that I want them to eat already exists. And if not, well, that's okay too. But, you know, this, I'm just telling you what the very best way to do it is. And then I can help people adapt it to their own operation. So I've got them in this pasture. They're just eating and grazing normally and drinking and doing all the regular cow things. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to begin to get them used to the idea that new foods aren't bad foods. And so what I do is I go to the, <clears throat> the feed co-op <clears throat> and I find um, feeds in bags that cows don't normally eat. And I choose eight of them. We're going to give them eight different options to try things. So I'll pick things like um, rolled barley, rolled corn, alfalfa pellets, uh, corn, oats, and barley mix. Um, I've said millet cottonseed meal, beet pulp pellets, soybean flakes, um, wheat bran, which is basically just a 50-pound bag of flour. Um, and, you know, all different. I'm looking for different um, textures, shapes, sizes, um, smells, and flavors. But they all should be nutritious, high in protein, so like cow candy. And then what I do is morning and afternoon for four days, I feed them these unfamiliar but nutritious foods. So the first morning, I and, and I feed them in these big 250-pound supplement tubs. What I like about these tubs is, first of all, most ranchers have them. You can get them for free <laughs> or, you know, use, your, use the ones that are sitting around in your barn or in your neighbor's barn or, you know, waiting to be recycled at the feed co-op, whatever. Um, and the other thing I like about them is that you can fit about three cow heads into them, <laughs> and that means that the cows stick their heads down there. They don't really know what the gal next to them is eating, and they will just grab for things because it's a competition. You must eat it before <laughs> someone else eats it. Okay, so I've got my tub. I show up, and, and I pick my schedule based on what works for me. Sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm working at a ranch that I have to drive away to, so... You know, I may start at like 8 or 9 in the morning. And then I hang around and do other things. And, and then I come back at like, oh, 3 or 4 in the afternoon and I feed them again. It's important to do it the same time every day and have the same person do it every day because what we're trying to do is create a routine at where trying new things seems normal. Mm. So I give them something in the morning. And, you know, I use... So what you need is one tub for every three cows, and then you need um, one 50-pound bag of feed for every 25 animals. So if I'm going to train 50 animals, I'm going to get two bags of each kind of feed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the cost comes out to about 250 bucks altogether. Now what I'm going to do is I, I'm feeding them in the morning, I feed them in the afternoon, and they're just getting a snack. It's, and what happens is they quickly figure out, wow, every time Kathy shows up, it's going to be something weird, but <laughs> it's going to be tasty. And so by the second day, they're usually like running to the tub, or sometimes they're just waiting there for me. <laughs> um, so they go through this, and sometimes they don't eat everything, but, you know, they always eat it all eventually. Then, on the fifth day, I skip the morning feeding. This makes them anxious because, mm -hmm. oh no, the routine is, is broken. 
where has she gone? And they are a little worried when I show up that afternoon, and so they're more anxious and ready to try whatever I'm bringing them. And this time, it's weed. And for a group of 50 cows, I will chop, I'll, I'll go find a patch of weed, and I will cut enough to loosely fill a couple of the, the tubs, and then I chop them up into about six inch lengths and I drop them inside the tub. And I do this because it, you know, they, they use their tongues to pull things off and bite them. Mm -hmm. And so if I cut them into smaller sections, then they can more easily grab, grab a piece and get it down. So they, I distribute the weeds among the tubs, and then I usually throw in, I like wheat bran the best because it's really flowery and it coats the weed, but I'm just giving them something that they've tried before because what I'm giving them now is really odd. So I put the weeds out there, they mill around a little bit, they think, well, she always gives us something weird, but it's always good, so let's try this. And all I want is for one cow to get one weed into her stomach because then she's going to get that good nutritional feedback from this weed, and she's going to want to eat more. So I do this on day five, and then I do it on day six. And all the time, every time I start feeding weeds, I start looking around in the pasture to see, okay, are they trying the weeds in pasture? And oftentimes, by the second day, they have already noticed that, oh, this thing that she's feeding us, it's growing right over here. <laughs> So they go over and they try and eat it. And they're not always successful because every weed, they're used to like how grass, how to bite off grass. So, you know, I'm used to using a fork, but I'm really not very good at chopstick. <laughs> That's how it is for a cow who's trying to learn how to eat cans of thistle as compared to grass. It's a little bit different, so she has to learn. So you'll see them like bending over the plants and you'll see them, you know, trying to bite things off and just mostly gumming it up and, and you'll see mashed things in your, your pasture and you'll think, ah, they haven't gotten it. But they are. They're just learning. So if, by, if on the second day I can see that they're trying, I quit feeding them. Mm. But if they're not, well, I feed them one more day. So there's three days of weeds and on the very last day I feed it to them plain. And that's it. Mm. And then I watch. So if you go to my YouTube channel, you can see cows, this whole process, and you can see how cows are trying things, and you can get a feel for what it looks like when a cow is trying a weed or a new food and how she tries to bite it off in pasture. And I put all this stuff up there so that people don't get nervous that things are going wrong. They're all going according to plan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, different herds learn in their pastures at different rates. Um, but they all eventually get it. Um, and, for example, in Montana, I was grazing with um, a herd that they just started grazing everything to the same height, whether it was a thistle or whether it was anything else. So, so there you go. That's the process. Very cool. I got a few follow-up questions here, but first of all, let me say that I just so much appreciate this process because there's so many good uh, things that are reinforced by everything that we know about cows. Uh, for example, uh, Justin Rhodes has a YouTube channel. He did a great American farm tour. He's done some other things in the past and he's more of a homesteader type, but he mm -hmm. went and talked to guys like Greg Judy and some of those others on his great American farm tour. And he said that, uh, one of the things he learned on that tour was that if you want to tame an animal down, you need to make it so that when you come around, good things happen. And that's kind of oh, what you're yeah. talking about with this process is that when I come around, good things happen and they're like, it's weird, but I'll eat it because it tastes good. And I love that part that you mentioned about the, the positive nutritional feedback. And I think yeah. that's a really, a really good nugget that we can mine for a second, uh, talking about the good nutritional feedback and how that plays into them learning to select for weeds and see them in the pasture and say, hmm, I'll try that. Okay, so you want me to tell you a little bit about how that works? Sure. Yeah, okay, so basically what, what we found, so the entire process is just based on science. I just read a whole bunch of things about how animals learn, and then I based it on science. So the science of how we know they learn, uh, how nutritional feedback impacts what they choose, 
um, basically what they what we've found is that the more nutritious the food is, the more likely an animal is to eat it. If it has a toxin in it or it's low in nutritional value, they're probably going to eat much less of it. So, for example, um, I like ice cream because it's really high in nutritional value. Celery? Well, yeah, I'll eat celery, but <laughs> it, it's not as tasty. So what we know is the flavor is basically derived from the nutritional feedback. And I, I actually have a whole article about this on, on pasture, so I don't want to go into it too deep. But, but basically, if a, food, if a food is nutritious, I can train an animal to eat it. If it's all dried out and just sick, um, I can't teach an animal to eat it because it's not in their interest to eat it. It's like it, you can't get me to eat toothpicks. There's just no reason for it. So um, basically, this all works simply because weeds are really nutritious. And they maintain their nutritional value longer through the summer than grasses do. And one of the reasons they're extra nutritious is that there is a whole lot more leaf to stem. So if you look at a grass, what makes it stand up is the stem that runs down the middle. And then there's a little bit of leaf on either side of that stem. When you look at a cannabis thistle or a leafy spurge, what you're seeing is a lot less stem and a whole lot more leaf. And that makes it more digestible for the animal and it carries a lot more nutrition. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so how, how critical is the time of the year to the training? I know you said that those weeds maintain their nutritional value longer than grass does, uh, but how, how critical is the time of year to the training process? Um, okay, so what we're going to look at is kind of the life cycle of the plant. Um, when the, the, There's kind of a, it's a curve. So they start out, you know, small and they're nutritious, but... As they grow and there's more of them, they become, you know, more of the plant body. It becomes more nutritious. And then about the time it starts to put on flower, that flower, um, it starts to go down a little bit. And then about the time it sets seed, that's probably the least nutritious time. So what you want to think about when you're looking in your pasture is, okay, I would like to train them before I typically want to train before things start to go to flower. And what happens then, um, and again, <laughs> there's a bunch of research that shows this happens, but once they get used to eating something, even as the nutritional value drops, they will keep on eating it because, well, you know, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. Kind of like once you've had a good experience, you keep on trying to have that experience. So they will eat less as it drops off. And I've actually found that with some plants, once it sets seed, they don't want to eat it at all because, well, it's toothpicks at that point, and they just don't, they don't want to eat it. Canada thistle is a little bit different because it sets seed at a variety of different times, and so it maintains value for longer. Um, but I guess what I'd say overall is I start early, and then I, that gives them a lot of time over the summer to practice eating that plant. And the really cool thing is that once they, once their mind is opened to the idea that, um, food is more than just grass, they start to experiment with other things in their pasture. And my experience is that they will start to eat everything in the pasture. And that's where you get so much more forage because now, Everything out there is food. Hmm. So I, I like to start early in the summer so that my animals have plenty of time to learn. Sure. And they'll continue their learning the next grazing season and the next grazing season after that. But this way, you get the biggest bang for your buck. Very cool. Yeah, really, really good stuff. Um, so we already did this interview once. And as I said earlier, I... I messed it up. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I know the answer to this question, but I'm going okay. to ask it anyways, because I want other people to hear it too, because the purpose of the Working Cows podcast is to provide 
producers with a platform to discuss and share paradigm challenging practices. And this is one of those practices that definitely is outside of a lot of people's paradigm. And the answer to this question is also well outside of other people's paradigm, I think, as well. So is this something that can replace applying herbicides or is that even something that we want to do given the nutritional value of the weeds? Um, (laughs) (laughs) I can see no reason for spraying a pasture for weeds. Uh, it's food. And just because you had a bad relationship with it in the past doesn't mean you have to continue that bad relationship. It's food, and it's really good food. And it can help your animals gain 2.2 pounds a day. (laughs) And you can have more animals. And you can, you have lower input costs, um, We all know that ranchers and farmers operate on really small margins, and this helps you increase your margin because you're not spending money on herbicides. You don't have to have the equipment to go around and spray it. Uh, You you don't have to spend time cleaning the sprayer, which, you know, to me, that is just a nightmare. I hate doing that. (laughs) So don't spray your pastures. Let your cows do this job for you, which is how I look at it. The other thing is that weeds provide you with a lot of resilience. Hmm. Um, I don't, I don't think that weeds should take over your pastures. I believe in biodiversity. You should have a whole diverse range of forages out there because then when drought comes, because drought will come, you have more chance of having some kind of forage out there that's going to help your livestock through the bad times, help you through the bad times. We all all think about this like, oh no, there was a drought and all the grass died, and now all I have is weeds. Yes, all you have is weeds. You're so lucky. (laughs) And I know this is not going to be a popular way to think about things, but just, it, you know, this kind of view started when I I first got goats. It was like everywhere I looked, there was food. And I I think that it would be helpful for ranchers to look out at their pastures and say, and think of everything that is green and growing as food. Hmm. Even leafy spurge is food. Yeah. That's so good. <laughs> really, <laughs> it is so good. You know, um, as with most paradigm challenging practices, the thing that we have to f- overcome is our own uh, concerns about what our neighbors think about us. Mm-hmm. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, that I think that's very fair. And a lot of the ranchers that I have worked with to teach their animals to eat weeds, the big thing has been, oh, so I, I hope this works because so-and-so just thinks I'm the stupidest person ever. <laughs> and it works every time. And, you know, sometimes if, if you're thinking about doing this, think of yourself as a hero, someone who, who's helping others bust through these, these ideas that are keeping them from growing. Because what I've found is, especially with farmers and ranchers, they really want to see how it works for someone else. And what do you have to lose? Like eight hours and two hundred and fifty dollars. You're spending more time than that on your herbicide, so and more money than that on your herbicide. So, you know, you have nothing to lose. And one of those and protein of tubs, course. one of those protein tubs that you had empty already would cost more than that to replace, and you're getting the benefits nutritionally of what would have been in that protein tub, anyways, right? Exactly. And now you don't have to buy the protein tubs anymore. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, man. So um, I have two more questions. One of them is an opportunity for you to promote yourself. And the first one I'm going to ask, though, is uh, kind of a more philosophical question about why weren't the animals selecting for these things before we came and trained them to do it? Oh, well, it's because nobody they know ate something. And so it doesn't look like food to them. So we, what we know about animals is, and people really do know this already, they eat 
what their mom ate. Mom is the biggest influence in, on what animals and what creatures eat. So if mom didn't eat it, well, I'm probably not going to try it. And if I'm being moved all the time so that I have grass, I don't need to eat it. And nobody eats it, so it must not be food. So for me, it's kind of like, well, I don't eat walrus blubber. Um, but I know people do, so probably I could eat it. So what I'm tr- what I'm trying to do with animals is just try to get them over their paradigms as well, which is, oh, only this tall, spiky stuff is food. And now I'm expanding their, their minds to the idea that, oh, if it's green and growing, it's probably food. I should try it. Hmm. So Very cool. That's what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's kind of like me. I don't eat tomatoes. Um, mm-hmm. When I started working at Subway when I was in high school, I didn't eat a lot of vegetables, but when I left Subway, the only one I still didn't eat was uh, was tomatoes. And I've tried to be really careful in front of my four children not to scare them off of eating tomatoes because I know they're good for them and they all seem to be able to handle eating them, but I just can't do it. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, the thing is that different bodies need different kinds and levels of, of nutrients. So, each of your animals is going to be a little bit different in his or her ability to eat a particular plant, but they can all eat some, eat it to a degree. So, hmm. yeah. Yeah, so good. Um, I never really want to cover the whole topic in one episode, which is part of a uh, a limiting factor of the fun- of the form of this podcast, you know, short interviews that you can digest in a sitting or in a commute. Mm -hmm. Um, What I want to do more than anything is wet appetites. And I hope we've done that here today. So first of all, let me say this. Thank you so much for the resource that On Pasture has been. It is an amazing resource, a place where just so much helpful information is collated into one place where people can go and just consume helpful information. So thank you for that, first of all. You're welcome. My pleasure. Now, I would like to give you the opportunity to share where it is people can go to continue learning about these things. What, Where can they go to find more information? Okay. Well, the quickest route is to go to onpasture.com. You'll see a menu bar across the top of the articles, and one of the items is special collections. If you click on special collections, it brings up basically collections uh, of art. We collected articles that people like to read a lot. And if you just scroll down, you'll find um, a topic that's like uh, weed management, teach your livestock to eat weeds. And if you click on that, you'll open up a page that has resources like um, you can Buy my book if you want. You can. I have a DVD available if you like to learn that way. Or if you just scroll down to the bottom of the page, I've um, basically collected all of the articles that um, I wrote about how to teach your livestock to eat meat. And also at the bottom there, there is a link to my YouTube channel so that you can go over and you can watch videos about how these animals are learning. And it gives you a really good feel for what the process looks like, and what animals look like when they're learning. The other thing you can do is you can go to my other website called livestockforlandscape.com. And I'm sure you'll put this up on your website so people can spell it and stuff. But if you go there, I also have a lot of um, information about the projects that I've done. And um, there's a list of weeds that I know livestock eat. Um, and so you can look at that list and see if your plant is on there. And finally, if your plant, it, you know, if you want to do this and you want to know if your plant is safe or you have a question, you can email me and I will answer your question because the point behind all of this isn't for me to get rich, it's for you to get rich. <laughs> and I want you to be able to do this and <laughs> I want you to have a, a good life. So you can email me at Kathy at onpasture.com, K-A-T-H-Y at onpasture.com. And for most people, I say, you know, on pasture, like cows grazing on pasture. (laughs) So 
Cool. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for your time today. Links to all those things will be at the show notes page, workingcows.net slash 34. We will have links to all the information that Kathy just shared, the YouTube channel, the special collections on onpasture.com, the livestock for landscapes. All that will be linked at workingcows.net slash 34. Kathy, thank you so much for your time again. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much. And remember, people, you can email me and I will help you. Sounds good. We will let them know. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Are you sinking in a swamp of sample rates and editing? Do you feel trapped in a prison of file formats and kilobits per second? It's time to drain that swamp. It's time to lock down those file formats. It's time to make your audio great again. And Chris Williams is the guy to do it. Head on over to chriswilliamsaudio.com for all your podcasting, music production, and film audio needs. I encourage you to check out the show notes page. There'll be all kinds of stuff there from Kathy, uh, workingcows.net slash 34. All the links to all the different things that we talked about, Kathy's book and the YouTube video series and onpasture.com and just such a great resource. So I encourage you to go check that out and we will see you next week for episode 35 of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.